like that title, and that's something I would like to aspire to be as well. So uh, <laughs> this is also being broadcast live on our AO YouTube channel. So check that out online if you're not able to be here in person. And uh, I think Fred's going to talk uh, to us today about science education and outreach th through tourism. Great. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, thanks. I've got to use this for the podcast, not so you can hear me. I'll probably forget. Uh, I th thought that uh, this was too good an opportunity to miss, though, uh, given that the New Horizons spacecraft will pass Pluto in less than three weeks. And also, to my delight, given that um, the, the president of the IAU, who's, who presided over Pluto's reclassification as a dwarf planet in 2006, is here, Ron Eakers. Uh, thank you very much for coming, Ron. I thought it would be um, remiss of me not to show this fantastic uh, movie-style trailer that has been made by the Planetary Society. 3,000 days. Where the sun is distant and faint is a place no one has ever seen before. Pluto and its system of moons, the farthest worlds ever to be explored by humankind. Half a century ago, we began the exploration of all the planets, making ever more distant journeys. Each new world, from Mercury to Neptune, revealed its own startling complexity, character, and unimagined beauty. As we now approach the Pluto system, reaching farther again, this year we are about to complete the historic first era of planetary exploration. As I said, that was uh, the National Space Society that prepared that, and you can find it on their website. It's very easy to find. If any of you have got outreach uh, uh, programs uh, that you're carrying out, it would be a great one to use. Uh, and, but you've only got until uh, <laughs> until uh, week two weeks on Wednesday to do it. Um, yeah, if you want to put the lights up, Lily. Um, I had another comment to make, and I've forgotten what it was. But it was about uh, about Pluto. Oh yeah, just very briefly. You saw the list of uh, of projects at the end there, and uh, one of the statistics that I love when I'm talking to <laughs> anybody really I is the fact that uh, if you add up all of NASA's the cost of all of NASA's robotic space missions for the last uh, fifty fifty seven years is that how long yeah fifty eight years since NASA a big pun fifty seven years since NASA was formed. Add the cost up, the Mercury probes, the Messenger, Voyager, Cassini, all of them add up their cost. It's enough to keep the Pentagon running for eight weeks. So that's, you know, I think that's why I'm a NASA fan. Uh, in fact, a NASA tragic. Now I need my glasses, which I've 
put down somewhere. Uh, that's all right. We'll have to do without them. Oh, they're in my shirt. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. It's good. Good. It's a good thing you're here. Can somebody hold the microphone? <laughs> it's all right. No. It's all right. I'm just falling to bits here. I've, g I've just got to do a slight readjustment. If you'll forgive me, um, I want to unmirror that, and now I want to show that. So uh, this talk is really. Uh, just to let you know the sort of things that I've been getting up to in my spare time, it's kind of what we did on our holidays. Uh, a, a reminder that, of course, 2015 is the International Year of Light. Uh, we are celebrating light and all its, uh, all, all its uh, ramifications this year. Uh, but the talk is about, not really to do with light, it's about tourism, global tourism, which I've kind of somehow got mixed up with, and what it means for astronomy outreach and a lot of you know that I've been doing tours uh, around the world over the last actually eight years now uh, and you probably wonder what I'm doing and how I get away with it and all the rest of it so this is the answer so like all the best things this is a trilogy in five parts uh, it, I, I want to talk a little bit about international tourism generally talk about the commercial sector with particular reference to the outfit that I'm involved with how you design a science tour and some recent highlights, um, which was very hard to do because there are so many of them. And just to mention at the end a little bit about our future plans. So the thing about tourism uh, is, well, it's on the increase. That's really all you need to know from that. Those astronomers in the audience will recognize the H and K lines of calcium there at the <laughs> bottom end. Uh, it, it, that's actually, uh, the left one is, uh, of course, 9-11. Uh, the right blip is the SARS uh, uh, epidemic. So um, the, the bottom line is that both inbound and outbound uh, departures uh, and arrivals are on the increase. Um, interestingly, most people who leave Australia go to New Zealand. Uh, over a million uh, a year. Uh, about um, a little bit less than that uh, going to the USA, half a million a year going to the UK, and uh, many of the other European destinations I'll mention are on the tail of this distribution. They're, they're, um, they're, they're sort of off the map. Uh, this is, well, blindingly obvious. It says that uh, the more money you have, the more likely you are to travel. So that's enough of that. But the bottom line is that um, in terms of outbound trips, well, 2014... These are leisure trips only. 8.1 million people left Australia uh, in 2014 uh, to, to go overseas. For leisure purposes, it's estimated to be 10 million by 2020. That's half the population. Uh, it kind of means that there's more room for the rest of us. So it's b a big market is the bottom line. Uh, but there are some really big butts uh, when it comes to the travel industry. And so uh, you need to have a look at how uh, the commercial sector works. Uh, and the trouble with travel is not that you go to nice places, is that there are a number of issues that really make it hard to, to, to make a living out of it. That's the first one. Uh, on retail travel, you know, somebody, a travel agent or someone who will sell you a tour, their margin is 0.3%. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, travel agents are actually uh, they're, they're screwed because they get the same award as shop assistants generally, but they've got all this background knowledge. They need to know uh, a lot of detail about travel in order to make it work. Um, outbound travel, of course, is subject to the exchange rate because you take people's money in dollars and then a few months go by and the exchange rate has then changed. And in particular, in recent uh, years, the last two years, it's plummeted. Uh, this is the dollar against the pound at the at the end there. So uh, really quite uh, low in 2013-14 and the first quarter of this year. Uh, so you might wonder how anybody makes a buck out of travel. And the, the big companies, the mass market companies, what they do is they literally run the same tours hundreds of times, uh, one, once a week. Uh, and they can use an unskilled workforce and they get large-scale accommodation contracts. You know, they book out entire hotels. Now, um, uh, the, the outfit I'm involved with uh, looks like this. Um, and it's, it's uh, beloved of our glorious leader, small business. Marnie Og is my partner, and she owns a company called Travelog. It's a, you know, she couldn't, obviously couldn't resist the pun. Uh, and she trades, or she did trade, as a company uh, called Fred Watson Illuminating Tours. Uh, and Fred Watson Illuminating Tours 
we don't have any more. And that's because uh, a couple of years ago, one of our clients pointed out that that abbreviates to FWIT. And, um, you know, who are you going on holiday with? Oh, FWIT Tours, really? Uh, so she's now uh, Fred Watson Tours and Events. She's not FWIT anymore. Um, and also a, s a little subsidiary called Star Trails, which I'll mention at the end, probably the day after tomorrow at the rate I'm going. Uh, so how does Travelog succeed? Um, so what she does is puts together these one-off tours tailor-made for quite a high end of the market. Uh, and it's the really the traveller who's already done all the usual stuff. They've carted themselves around Europe and America and Asia, and they want something a little bit different. Uh, there's a kind of viability sweet spot of about 15 to 25 passengers on one t uh, sorry, two to three week uh, tours. These are the overseas tours now that we're talking about. And the theme is science, history, culture. Um, all, all of the above, anything that uh, we're interested in, and the, the demographic of people who are basically interested in everything. I'll show you that uh, in a bit more detail in a minute. She makes economies without compromising quality. That means that, for example, if we're doing a European tour, we do two back-to-back -to, -back to save a return, a couple of return fares back to Australia. Uh, she gets me for nothing. I don't charge anything for my services to Travelog. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be allowed to for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and uh, what I get out of it, of course, is a lot of really interesting trips. Um, but the key thing, and I think where we really win, is we've got this enormous network. Because I'm so old and I've done so many things in astronomy, I know a lot of people around the world. So we've got all these colleagues uh, all over the place. Andy Cameron in St. Andrews, Bertil Pettersson in Uppsala, David Levy, a very great and well-known American astronomer uh, in Tucson with his first telescope there. Uh, a lovely picture. Uh, Karen Moran, the uh, librarian of the Crawford Collection in Edinburgh. Dominique Proust, did you know that as well as being uh, one of uh, the Observatoire de Paris' uh, best-known astronomers, he's also one of France's best-known organists, and that's him doing his thing. So we get uh, things from him. There's Bob Argyle in Cambridge. Uh, this is just to give you a flavour of the kind of people that we, uh, we interact with. Kari Nielsen, a lovely guy in Finland uh, on a beautiful snowy day. Nick Petford is a volcanologist, not an astronomer. Here he is with his family on the flanks of the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii. Uh, Nick is, uh, so he comes with us to Iceland and Hawaii and places like that. He's also the Vice Chancellor of Northampton University and was recently in the headlines for crowd surfing with the first years. Um, he's, a, he's, he's a bit of a lad, is Nick, and he fits in very well uh, with our tours. And of course, Matthias Steinmetz, who I've worked closely with for the last decade in Potsdam, on the right here, the director of the Leibniz Institute in Potsdam. And I've put Hans Sinica in brackets because we haven't nobbled him yet, but he's the deputy director of SOFIA, the Stratospheric uh, Infrared Observatory, and he's quite interested in doing something with us. Whether we'll get on there, uh, 747 SP for a trip is a different uh, matter. Thomas Posch in Vienna, uh, Felix Zeiler, Jungfrau Joch, the list goes on. Uh, what about uh, Travelog's clientele? Well, it's people like that. Um, uh, they're baby boomers, basically. Uh, that's the, the sort of market. Uh, one interesting thing I didn't put down here, there is a slight preponderance of female travellers, uh, just uh, uh, perhaps counterintuitively, because you might expect they'd all be astronomy tragics, but there are surprisingly few. Um, some of them are people who might not otherwise engage with science, people who have never really given a thought to science. And there are some really quite highly influential people among them, uh, university vice chancellors, high court judges, members of other members of the legal profession, company directors, they turn up uh, with uh, the aim of finding out about the wider world. And I think this is an amazing statistic which has grown over the last seven years. Uh, it's now two out of three people who travel with us have been with us before. And some just don't care where they go as long as it's with Marnie. They, um, come up and say, so where are we going next year, Marnie? And, well, she fixes it up. Uh, so there's no need for marketing. That saves money as well. No need to advertise. Um, how do you design uh, a science tour? Uh, well, it's a balance, uh, quite a delicate balance. Uh, you uh, basically uh, start off with the idea of providing people with a good experience. Uh, Australian standards are pretty high, so you're always looking at four-star accommodation and catering. Um, 
you provide this mix of science history, other destinations, because not everyone's interested in the same thing. Minimize the one night stands. This is what the mass market does. They put you in a hotel for a night, then you move on somewhere else the next night. We minimize that and try and give people some really rather relaxing schedules. Put in unexpected highlights. We always have a great time if it's somebody's birthday and they don't know that we know that it's their, their birthday. And allow adequate rest and personal time. We've actually, I think, got quite a good track record with disabled people as well. Uh, last year we took uh, a lady up to the Arctic who was wheelchair bound and uh, she had a fantastic time. Uh, and the other thing is that, um, as I mentioned, you do tours back to back to save money. So this was our first two Arctic tours, several transfers, but two run together. Um, and so what you're trying to do is, is balance the, the sort of nocturnal experience up in the north, this is for the Aurora Borealis, with the kind of cultural stuff, many observatories, Tycho Brahe's observatory in, uh, in, um, in the Öresund, uh, off to Iceland, all that sort of thing. And of course, it's not just me. <laughs> Did you expect to see yourself on the... No. <laughs> Bit of work needed, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've had David Malin, Ray Norris, uh, Malcolm Walter, and a, a whole uh, lot of other people, including Stuart, who's here. I'm sorry, I couldn't remember what the proper name is here. She's not Mrs. Ryder, I know. <laughs> she is Mrs. Ryder, okay. <coughs> so... Um, a very nice group of people, but you've got to, if you go to the Arctic, you've got to enjoy cold weather, which David doesn't, which is why he hasn't been with us yet. Uh, I've done 19 tours, I think, or been involved with them. There's been uh, four, eight of them have been kind of telescope history tours. Um, a uh, few of them have been um, uh, uh, Aurora tours, that's the, the, the green ones, of course, it's the oxygen green line. Uh, a couple of, uh, uh, of um, uh, archaeoastronomy tours and uh, some eclipse tours which have just disappeared in white there. So that's the sort of things that we've been do doing. So what I wanted to do, uh, that's okay, we're reasonably well off for time. I just wanted to take you through some highlights. This was really difficult uh, to select because there's so much fantastic stuff that we've seen. But the place that's very close to my heart is the far north, the Arctic region, where we go for the Aurora tours. This is Norway's M1. Um, it's the E6, it runs up the west side of Norway and this is taken during the Arctic winter. It's not a road that um, you really think of as being like the M1 in, <laughs> in Australia. Occasionally I have to stop for reindeer and of course you've got to stop at the Polar Zoo to see the, uh, the Arctic fox cubs which everybody loves. But it's this <coughs> region in the far north that we were heading for because that's a really significant area in humankind's understanding of how the aurora borealis works. So this area between Tromsø and Alta, lots of fjords uh, running principally, predominantly north-south up, up to the Arctic Ocean. This is Lingen Fjord with the Lingen Alps in the background uh, with uh, lots of uh, glaciers. This is Alta Fjord, um, which is uh, the, uh, the fjord near, near Alta, as the name implies. This picture was taken at noon, so midday in December. So the sun is actually below the horizon at that time of the year because you're well north of the Arctic Circle. The sun doesn't rise, but it's not dark. You've got this, I think, absolutely charming light. It's, a, uh, it's like being in constant twilight uh, with the Earth's shadow, actually, that gray region behind the clouds there uh, projected on the atmosphere. Alta has a museum, a fantastic museum, uh, because they've got petroglyphs there as well as other things. But the museum used to be a Cold War nuclear fallout shelter, so they've got the best washroom doors I've ever seen. Uh, you know, it survive any kind of blast that you... Well, no, I won't go there. Um, uh, they also have... Um, they also have the Northern Lights Cathedral, which was only finished last year, this our previous trips, this has been a, a building site and looked horrible. But it is now a stunning building, beautiful building. We went to a concert there just before Christmas. And that's the Alta Fjord in the background. But these hills uh, behind Alta have a very important part to play in the science of the aurora. Uh, and it's through this gentleman. I'm sorry this was such, a, such an awful photograph. But this is a man called Christian Birkeland, 
who was Norwegian, as you might gather, worked at the university as it then was called Christiania, that's the old name for Oslo, uh, Oslo University. And he wintered over, actually, on those hills in 1899 to 1900. They had a terrible time. You can imagine, it's pretty bleak up there. Uh, and he published this book about the Aurora Borealis expedition. Uh, it, he, there's his observatories, which are on those mountains. It's called Halde, the site. Uh, a, a rather interesting guy. Um, by rights, he should have had the Swedish flag in the corner of the Norwegian flag because uh, Norway was a province of Sweden at that time, not for much longer, but he was fighting against all that. Uh, so he was the person who really worked out that aurora are caused by stuff coming from the sun. There's some of his photographic plates in, uh, in, <laughs> in the museum in Alta. David Merlin used to use stuff like this, you know, <laughs> Trockenplatten dating from the uh, 1890s. Um, he also, in Oslo, built a machine uh, that simulated the aurora. He, it's called the Torella, the Little Earth. And he had a magnetized model of the Earth in the middle and bombarded it with electrons. Um, you, he, you can see him, he's wearing a fez here, which I always think is a bad sign in a scientist. Once you start wearing a fez, people know you're going bonkers, uh, which he did in the end. Uh, the Torella, however, uh, the Little Earth, demonstrated really rather well that you can get um, uh, an excitation of illumination near the poles of a magnet uh, by bombarding it with electrons. So these are some pictures made. Uh, you can get very glitzy professional images of the aurora on the web now. These are made by one of our tour participants, actually taken from the light polluted skies of, of Tromso uh, in, uh, about three years ago. Uh, and it gives a very good impression of what the aurora looks like, speeded up by a factor of about two. But this is bright enough that you, know, you, you can see it over the city lights. What um, Birkeland did was said, Okay, it's, it's electrons coming from the sun that cause this. He called them cathode rays. Uh, and he published that in that little book I showed you and was greeted with derision by the British in particular and the Royal Society especially because the Royal Society thought that everything that came from the sun had been invented by the British. So like gravity, like light, uh, infrared, how could a Norwegian suggest that something would come from the sun and be right? You know, it's a perfect uh, audacity. So they pilloried him and he never really recovered from that. That's my best attempt with a, with a, a point and shoot camera. Uh, poor old Birkeland actually died at a very young age. Uh, he died in Tokyo. He was going from Egypt to Norway, but went via Japan to avoid the British. That's how much he felt p pursued by the British. And he died uh, in Tokyo in 1917 because he was paranoid, uh, exacerbated by the use of sleeping drugs. It was 50 years later, 1967, when a, a U.S. Navy spacecraft actually detected exactly the things that he had predicted and for that reason he's now on the 200 kroner note and I'm delighted to say and this was something I only found uh, last year because I hunted it out his Torella is still in a museum in Oslo there it is looking exactly as it did on the photographs uh, you can do all sorts of things in Oslo if you want you can become a polar explorer um, just by sticking your face through a through a hole in the wall. Um, you can also, I've developed a rather soft spot for Norwegian confectionery, and they have this thing called a quick lunch. Um, and a quick lunch is basically a Kit Kat on steroids. They're really good, lots of chocolate, uh, but I've never been sure about the plops. Uh, the plops are, I don't know, I think that's a little bit unfortunate somehow. Whizzing you around the world a little bit, and forgive me, uh, we've got another <laughs> 20 minutes of this stuff or thereabouts. Spaceport America, quite an interesting destination. If you go to uh, New Mexico, if on the road from El Paso up to Albuquerque, it's uh, Route 25, sorry, Route 25, and you come to a place called Truth or Consequences, which has a really interesting history, which is kind of the Kuna Barabran of the, of the State 25. And to the, a few kilometers, about 30 kilometers to the east of that, uh, is the Spaceport America site. If you keep on going and go further east, you get to the White Sands Proving Ground. So it's a place of more or less desert, uh, and it is closed airspace. That's why the Spaceport America is there, because it's, there's, there's no jets, uh, commercial jets allowed to fly over it. Of course, if you go further east, you get to Roswell, um, and that brings all kinds of interesting ideas out. Um, but Virgin Galactic uh, have... Uh, basically said they are going to fly uh, 
uh, commercial space flights from, it's called Upham. Can you believe it? Upham, uh, New Mexico. And they've, uh, Virgin Galactic have contributed towards their terminal, which is this building here. These are, of course, PR photographs because you don't see the space planes when you go and look at it. Um, that terminal and the uh, New Mexico s uh, or the Spaceport America Control Building, which is this one, uh, set back the government of New Mexico uh, $212 million. And so they are quite keen for it to stop being a white elephant and for Virgin Galactic uh, to get going. So Virgin Galactic won't let you in the uh, terminal building because they want to make that a big surprise when it all happens. But you can go around uh, the Spaceport America headquarters. <laughs> Sadly, it's deserted, uh, but uh, it's very, very elegant. And they've got this fantastic fire service as well. So they're all ready for anything that might happen. It is quite an extraordinary place. You've, uh, you know, it's one of these places which is just full of open space. The runway, three kilometers long, nearly 100, kilome uh, 100 meters wide, not kilometers, um, l big enough to land space planes. They don't like letting people on the runway because you're always worried about debris uh, being left on the runway, and of course that can be catastrophic. But we got to roam on the runway. There are the two buildings I showed you. This. Um, uh, threshold strip was just uh, too big a temptation for um, <laughs> for our, our passengers. We just had to get involved with all that. Uh, not far away, and this is uh, my token radio telescope, <laughs> Ron. Uh, not far away, of course, is the VLA, the Very Large Array, uh, I also in New Mexico. And if you go the other way, back to Arizona, there's the, the Barringer Meteor Crater. Very, very dramatic a uh, kilometre or so across. And once again, returning to the Pluto theme, uh, the telescope on which the dwarf planet Pluto uh, was discovered back in 1930, the astrograph at the Flagstaff, uh, the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff. Uh, we had a great uh, tour there. This, that's a plate holder and a half, is that? Uh, beautiful old telescope. Whizzing you back to Europe, if I may, um, the top and bottom of Europe. This is part of the top of Europe. That's the Aletsch Glacier, the largest longest glacier on mainland Europe. And this little group down here is a bunch of glaciologists looking at a crevasse uh, because that's one of the indicators that we have for climate change. Of course, the reason for going to Switzerland, we were there earlier this year, is um, the Large Hadron Collider down in Geneva. Th this was a, it's called our Einstein Equations Tour. It was about uh, celebrating 100, 100 years of general relativity, but we put in a few other things as well, like the collider. This is not one of my photos. This shows the uh, idea of these 27 kilometer long tubes that carry uh, mostly protons going in opposite directions, which are collided at very high energies. Um, I, I, I've been there a couple of times before and been staggered by the technology. That's what's inside these pipes, 27 kilometers of that sort of thing. It is quite extraordinary. Uh, but this particular visit, um, we, we went to one of the detectors, which I haven't been to before, something called the CMS, the Compact Muon Solenoid, which is about eight kilometers from the rest of the site. It's quite a, quite a long way around the circumference. And one of our surprises that uh, we gave our tour guests, and indeed gave me, because I didn't know until the afternoon, was that we actually got a trip down to the cavern. This was a week before it was switched back on again uh, earlier this year. And the compact muon solenoid building, uh, when you go into it, has this life-sized cross-section of the what the detector looks like. This is a detector that basically picks up the pieces of smashed up at um, at atomic nuclei when you've fired them together. But in the foreground of this picture, you can probably just see it. There's a big hole. And looking down that, you've got a 100-meter drop to the cavern in which the real thing is placed. And uh, that's looking the other way. That's looking back up to the ceiling of the building that we were in. So this is about the size of the AAT dome. If you imagine a hole about the size of the AAT dome, it's, uh, it's more or less that kind of scale. The uh, cavern itself, there's the kind of top of it, um, hi enormous, huge engineering. These are the pole pieces and uh, shields of uh, the final magnet in the, in the circuit before the colliding particles actually hit the detector. So the particles come out of the tube along here and basically into the detector, which is on the left there. Uh, there it is. That's And there were people, you can just about see somebody there, working on this thing. It's, uh, I think, around about 15 or 20 meters in diameter. It is the compact muon solenoid. Imagine what it would be like if it wasn't compact. 
uh, very, very large. And engineering on a scale that, you know, you can see this sort of stuff. That's solid um, electronics and uh, detector technology and on, on a scale that really I, I think is very impressive. So we were surprised to be allowed down there and, well, I was just delighted, as you can probably tell. Um, uh, I'm happy to talk about the Collider if anybody wants to know more uh, later on. Uh, going from Geneva down there uh, to another of my favorite places in the whole world, which is the Jungfrau Joch Observatory. Uh, they call themselves the top of Europe, uh, and that's where it is there, where the arrow is. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, have been here because this is a very, very popular ski area between the Tunersee and the Brinzersee. Uh, there is Interlaken, you get a railway up, a rack railway that actually goes through the inside uh, of, the, of the mountains and takes you to this point on a ridge between uh, two mountains. Uh, it looks like that, pretty spectacular, you know. Uh, we think we've got mountains on hills in Australia, uh, sorry, telescopes on hills in Australia, but it's not like that. Of course, it's a crap site because it's in Europe, so the weather, as you can see there, is not the best. But to get there, you start off uh, at lake level. This is um, uh, a place called Spitz on the um, uh, Tunersee, and get a whole bunch of rack railways and it's all tunnels and things uh, to take you up to the Jungfrau Joch Observatory. And when you finally get there, of course, you have a thin atmosphere. It's over 3,000 meters high uh, and some marvelous views. This telescope, sadly, is no longer used. It's um, a 75-centimeter telescope, which I actually have a, an involvement with because I hardly dare say this, but in 1969, I went there to fix their mirror. Uh, I didn't go up the mountain. It was in Geneva. They'd illuminized it, and one of the mounting blocks had fallen off, and I was a young uh, kind of supposedly a physicist uh, working for the company that built this telescope, so I went out and stuck it back on again uh, with uh, stuff like hydrofluoric acid and all kinds of other goodies. So there we all are. The view is sensational. That's looking back to Interlaken and over... Uh, pr probably towards France. And what they do now is mostly atmospheric physics. It's all about sampling the atmosphere, looking at uh, global warming, climate change, all that sort of thing. They had a very nice uh, Fourier transform spectrometer that they use uh, to analyze sunlight and look at the contents of the atmosphere. Great stuff. So from the bottom of Europe to the top of Europe, and now briefly, if I may, to take you back to Scandinavia, uh, to southern Sweden and this dome contains a telescope, another one that's quite close to my heart. Uh, it's one the world's sixth biggest Schmidt telescope. Uh, we have the second biggest, the UK, oh actually it's the third biggest, the UK Schmidt telescope at Siding Spring, operated by the Australian Astronomical Observatory. This one is a one meter Schmidt. It resembles ours rather uncannily, except of course the polar axis is tilted up at 60 degrees rather than 30 degrees because the latitude uh, is so much higher. Uh, the Schmidt, operated by the University of Uppsala, now sadly no longer used because the weather is too poor. Uppsala astronomers, of course, use the knot, the Nordic Optical Telescope, or the European Southern Observatory facilities down in Chile. But this place has a number of unexpected features. If you go uh, probably about 20 kilometers further north, you get to this marvelous castle, which is called Skokloster. Um, I didn't take this picture because I've never been there when there are leaves on the trees. It's an extraordinary place. It was built in the middle of the 17th century by a man who was actually a wealthy merchant but aspired to nobility. Uh, that's him there. Uh, sadly, I can't remember his name. He, um, he basically vanished from the scene uh, in the mid-1600s. But he, he was filled with the idea of making an opulent place for people to visit. There's all his family, uh, not for the public to visit, of course, for his chosen colleagues to visit. He had the most obsessive collections of things like armory. This is one reason why this is such an important place. He collected arms and armor. He collected tools. This is his lathe. Uh, and all the tools, you can see how they're all arranged. This is all dates from uh, round about 1650 or thereabouts. But what makes it incredible and really unexpected is he ran out of money. And when he ran out of money, 
uh, all the people working for him walked off the job. The place was not finished. The ballroom was still in progress. So you've got this ballroom that is as it was left by uh, workers in about 1650 when they said, stuff this for a lark. Uh, if we're not getting paid, we're, we're buggering off. And so they did. And I mean, that's a modern bucket, but most of the stuff you can see there dates from the mid-1600s. Really quite extraordinary. And what's even more extraordinary is that if you go up to the, the attics of this castle, uh, you can, <laughs> if you know the right people, find a room in which you can pull covers off and there is the most exquisite collection of 17th century telescopes. Um, some of these date from the first dozen years of the history of the telescope, uh, the first 20 years of the 17th century. Uh, there, there was one there, I, was, I, had a, I have a photograph of it somewhere, I couldn't find it, that staggered me because I didn't think one existed. It was described in 1647 by Johannes Evelius. He made these things. He wrote a book called Selenographia. Uh, and there's a picture of this extraordinary telescope. And there's one in this collection. It's unbelievable, uh, uh, absolutely staggering. So that stuff, one of Europe's great um, untold secrets, um, do, uh, globes and maps. The man was a nutcase. He collected all this stuff, ran out of money, but left us this wonderful heritage of, of, uh, of a picture of life in the 17th century. Somewhere close to Neville's heart, um, uh, we had a tour a couple of years ago uh, to Africa, which was uh, the most stunning in terms of wildlife. I don't have time to show you any of that. All the beauties of Cape Town and what was there. Only a couple of telescopes, one of which many of you will be familiar with. It looks like a factory chimney. This is SALT, the Southern African Large Telescope, a copy of the Hobby Eberly Telescope in, uh, in the United States. Um, it's a big telescope. It's a 10 meter of rather unusual design. When you go inside the dome, all you can see is structure. There's the mirror, the back of the mirror, uh, segmented 10 meter diameter mirror. Um, and now doing pretty good work. It's taken them a long time to get it to come properly online. But if you go north of South Africa to Namibia and drive to, uh, go to Windhoek and drive south a bit, uh, you come across something that looks a bit surreal in the highlands of Namibia. And it's this thing, uh, which is a set of actually five telescopes, a big one and four small ones, uh, which is called HESS. It's the High Energy Stereoscopic System. These are basically gamma ray telescopes, which look at flashes of light that come from the atmosphere when the atmosphere is ex excited uh, by gamma rays. And the big one uh, is an ELT, essentially. Uh, its segmented mirror is 32 meters by 24 meters. And standing underneath it gives you an idea of what it will be like to stand beside an ELT, the extremely large telescopes. The TMT being built in Hawaii will be like this. It is huge, it's just amazing. This is the detector. Uh, it's um, used to basically detect very faint flashes of light uh, from these interaction events. So they've got photomultipliers, probably avalanche photodiodes, which of these effectively feed horns uh, sending the light down into them. Um, but really uh, an extraordinary place to find out in the, in the middle of nowhere, no covering for it, it hardly ever rains there, uh, and what they do is they turn, as you can see, they park it with the, the mirror downwards when it's not in use. Major engineering, uh, actually mostly funded by the Germans, it's the German high energy community that have done the work on this. Taking you back, uh, to some other places. I have a secret obsession, uh, <laughs> and it's little places like this. Uh, small telescope domes. This is actually at Kvisterberg, where the uh, Swedish Schmidt telescope is. But this telescope was built in the early 20th century by a man called Niels Tam, who owned the site. He was an artist, uh, and he made this lovely uh, little observatory dome with uh, a small refracting telescope inside it. I have a very soft spot for these refractors. There's Bertil again. I you can't get a good photograph of them because they're, they're too big for, a, for, for the normal lenses, but commonly made by the Zeiss company. Um, here's one that's a bit bigger than that, but another one that I'm very fond of. This is the Grosse Refractor from uh, Potsdam, the, the giant refractor, an 80 centimeter lens at the top uh, with uh, uh, Matthias Steinmetz showing us around. Uh, an amazing telescope. Uh, when, I, it, when I was about 16, I dreamt about climbing up and down things like this, and I've never quite got over it. Um, if you go to uh, Tartu in Estonia, you see some funny buildings for a start. That's their 
what is now their art center. Um, until it falls over, I'm sure it will eventually. It's subsidence, of course, that does that. But at the top of the hill, there is this beautiful building, which is the old Dorpat Observatory, the Tartu Observatory. That uh, dome or enclosure contains uh, now a um, fairly modern, by that I mean less than 100 years old, uh, Zeiss uh, refracting telescope, a 10 inch uh, refractor, 25 centimeters. But down in the basement is the jewel, and perhaps the jewel of all of Europe, which is Fraunhofer's masterpiece from 1825, the great Dorpat refractor, beautifully restored uh, by um, the people at Tartu. And finally, uh, what I think is probably the most unusual telescope in the whole world anywhere is at the Archenold, uh, Archenold Observatory in Berlin. I don't know whether any of you have been here. It's in a park. Uh, I should explain that when we go to places on tour, the local we nearly always take the local guide somewhere they've never been before. And our guide here was gobsmacked. He'd never heard of this, didn't know it existed. Uh, the local guide. So we educate the locals as well as all the other stuff we do. You get an idea that there's something funny going on when you look at the building from the back. And it is, it's this. Uh, this is the Archenold Refracting Telescope. Um, kind of gets, I you know, it's got all kinds of um, echoes of the First World War uh, for all the wrong reasons. But it was indeed built, it was built in 1896 for an exhibition that took place in 1900 and it was expected it would last for four years and then it would be dismantled. But it's still going, it's a public observatory. Uh, and basically the whole thing's pivoted at one end. There's a lens at that end, which if I remember rightly is about 50 centimeters in diameter. And then the eyepiece is down here that's covered up uh, against the rain by this shelter, that's removed. Uh, but basically the whole thing pivots on one point and it's actually for you, you astronomers, is on an equatorial mountain. So this is the uh, hour circle. The declination circle is here. The whole thing waves around. These are two counterweights. You can only see one of them. They weigh 11 tons each, uh, and they counteract the weight of the tube. And to look through it, what you do is you climb up on this platform, and you will find that there is an eyepiece there uh, which doesn't move. So you stand there and you just look all around the sky, whatever you want to see, um, and basically the person in charge of it, this man's name is Felix as well, he uh, drives it and points it in the right direction. There is, um, there is a crude finder telescope here which looks up the same tube, so that lets you find Jupiter and things of that sort, but he was telling us it's nearly impossible uh, to find things that you want. But amazing stuff. So uh, the Archenold Observatory, I think one of the uh, uh, one of the hidden jewels of uh, of the world of, uh, of of astronomy, astronomy outreach. Um, I said I'd say something about future plans, and this is where this uh, the Star Trails uh, product name that I was telling you about comes in. Uh, Marnie um, got fed up of always being at the mercy of the exchange rate, so she's now venturing into inbound tourism. And in particular, she's looking at a market to publicize uh, where we live, which is uh, the northern beaches. Um, so what she's planning to do is take people on a tour around the delights of the northern beaches, and there are many, winding up in a place where the sky is relatively dark. We've got a secret hidey hole where with a dark sky. Apparently somebody dumped a load of rubbish outside it yesterday, so we're not very happy about that. But uh, there is a place with a dark sky, and we'll do some astronomy outreach. So um, the reason I'm mentioning this is that Marnie has already sent round an invitation to uh, astronomers on our staff uh, that if you're interested in looking after some of these tours, and, and all that means is the astronomy bit, not guiding people around the northern beaches, it's the astronomy bit. She'd be very glad to hear from you because she wants to run these things uh, relatively frequently. And if you do volunteer and uh, come along, come and see me if you're interested. I know some of you have already been in contact. But we promise we won't make you do what people seem to always want to make me do, uh, which is make a fool of myself as here in Iceland. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your... <laughs>
Thank you, Millie. So um, I think I see some people here who work at Sydney Observatory, and I know that um, we have some, you know, we have our own sort of science program there. But if you had any tips for if you were wanted to sort of join your tours or sort of do something like this, do outreach, like how you go about designing a science program that would interest the general public. Yeah. Thank you. So exactly that. Look, the thing that you've got to do with the public at large is assume zero knowledge. And that means that you don't get very far in terms of the astrophysics of what's going on, although people are interested in all the latest esoteric news headlines. Uh, so um, I think uh, you, you have to bear that in mind. Now, uh, at some point in the not-too-distant future, uh, there will be a new observatory manager appointed at Sydney Observatory. Uh, and that person might well have all kinds of ideas of their own. There is there's a slight delicacy here, which is something that um, I was um, a bit unprepared for, because we in the science world, we... We don't keep any secrets, really. Uh, generally, we don't. We're, um, and I can't help it. I just tell people everything, uh, which is sometimes a bit embarrassing. Uh, but So you, you have to um, remember that in the commercial world, there's IP. There are IP issues, which are actually quite um, pertinent. So uh, I know that um, Marnie has been stung by a, an organization that I w whose name I won't mention, but they work with one of the big museums in in Sydney, and they uh, basically, this company was uh, was hired to do their, to look after their tours. They sort of took Marnie on board as a consultant and stole all, all her ideas without any acknowledgement. And that kind of thing naturally makes you a bit wary about giving away secrets. Now, there aren't actually that many secrets. It's really all about how you choose good places to go, what the what the sort of uh, things are that y you know people would like to see. At Sydney Observatory, it's the instruments themselves. People are always amazed by that. And, and if they get a, a look at the sky rather than the just the pylons of the Harbour Bridge, that's, that's a great bonus as well. From Sydney, of course, you're talking about Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, the moon, uh, and the sun during the day, and not much else. And uh, uh, so, uh, I beg your pardon. Yes, I was, I, I was going to mention that, that um, that's, uh, we have done um, sort of indigenous cultural tours, and the Aboriginal program is very, very important here in Australia. And, of course, we will actually be uh, s stressing that in the, uh, the Star Trails program that she's just starting up. Stuart, you've got to hold the mic. So as someone who's been on some of Fred's tours, I can say it's definitely a, a real highlight and a great way to bring astronomy to a broader audience. So Fred, do you want to say a bit about uh, what do you think are the traits that make it for a good tour guide, a good tour leader? <laughs> there is actually a number one uh, requirement, and <laughs> not all astronomers have this. You've got to like people. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you like people, honestly, you're pretty well 90% there because you will then empathise with them. And when they look at you and say, what? I don't know what you're talking about. You'll, you'll respond and, and explain it. Uh, y you need a little bit of, um, I, I guess, a bit of initiative because even though when you're doing one of these tours, uh, and you will know this, actually you were thrown into the deep end, Stuart. You actually had your own tour and, uh, and it was a family tour. So you had kids as well. Uh, the, uh, the throw it, being thrown in at the deep end is uh, something that often brings out the best in people or occasionally the worst. Um, but normally that wouldn't happen. Normally you would have uh, a, a tour guide or um, probably Marnie actually looking after the, the, the logistics of it. I'm always staggered by the way in which um, she can multitask. I can only do one thing at a time, as you've noticed. Uh, she will be leading a group around and on the phone to somebody in Australia about um, exchange rate issues for the accommodation that we've got tomorrow night in a different country. And it, and it just sort of juggles all this stuff. I think it's, I know it's um, probably a sexist thing to say, but I think it is a very female characteristic that I, I really struggle with trying to do more than one thing at once, uh, whereas um, it's not always like that. Uh, actually, just talking about that, you uh, might have noticed that um, uh, many of the... Th th there's a kind of male bias to the... Not so much the tour guides, because we've, you know, we've, we've uh, basically been as, as um, 
equal gendered in that as we possibly could, but in the people who are the contacts. And that's a kind of historic thing, really. It, it's because I go back a long way, so the people I know come from a different era, uh, many of them from uh, 20 years ago when we were in a very different environment regarding gender balance from what we are now. So we're trying to address that. That's what I want to say, that we are trying very hard to make sure that there aren't any hidden biases in what we do, there's nothing that would be regarded as inappropriate. David, and then Ron. Yes, I'd like to say something about, um, about how you entertain people on a tour like this, because we're often on buses for long times and traveling for, for ages. Um, wherever you get to anywhere astronomical, any, as in my case anyway, uh, I'll try and tell some kind of story about the place, some, some story that maybe even the tour guides at the place don't know. Sydney Observatory, for instance, were the first photographs of the Magellanic Clouds. And the, uh, the photographer, Chamberlain, the director at the time, noticed a spiral. He, d he published the fact that there's a spiral structure in the large Magellanic Cloud. Well, that's not of any interest to a, to a crowd. But you can say, quite openly, that P is a galaxy that was seen to be a spiral very early on. It's a nearby galaxy to the Milky Way, and it doesn't look like a spiral unless you've got this educated eye. If you go to parks, for instance, there are a thousand stories to tell there. One of the nicest ones is to do with uh, Cyril Hazard and the discovery of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the, first, the, the, the first quasar. Plenty of stories, too, at the AAO to tell. Uh, they all involve people. It's always important, I think, to describe, in the case of Sydney Observatory, this grumpy old director, Chamberlain, who one of his staff tried to explode with a, a, a little package bomb at one stage. <laughs> he was deeply, as you do, well, there's a, there's a thought, yes. <laughs> So the, uh, just a bit of research will give you an entertaining story to introduce some science in a way that is painless to people who are not specially interested in science. Uh, so Fred, you, uh, you opened with uh, your spectacular uh, <laughs> pictures of the aurora, uh, having uh, just come back from an exhibition which I organized myself to try and see one from, uh, from Iceland. My question is, what's your hit rate and how do you handle the situation when it's raining and cloudy and people go to a lot of effort and see nothing? Um, thank you very much. That's a, that, that is actually a great question. And uh, if you run a, uh, an eclipse tour or an aurora tour, a transit of Venus tour, we probably won't run one of those for a while <laughs> yet. Uh, the next one's 117 years or something. Um, if you run any of these things, you've got to start off with a caveat. You know, there are no guarantees. You are as likely, well, uh, the, uh, the classic case is the eclipse in the Faroes, which was on the 20th of March this year. We went to the Faroe Islands. The Faroe Islands have 280 days of rain a year, and so we didn't think our chances were high, and indeed we only saw little bits of the eclipse. Uh, but that's actually, I'm, I'm kind of relieved to say, that's been our only failure. Uh, we've always told people that we wouldn't see, probably wouldn't see the aurora on this night, and then we've seen it. Actually, we saw the uh, aurora in the Faroe Islands. So you, you just have to tell it like it is. And uh, usually when you're in the Arctic, it's the weather that stuffs you up. Um, but uh, sometimes the sun is just quiet and you don't get anything. Did you see the aurora on your trip? Um, yes, and no. Uh, we saw it through thin clouds. Yes. It takes the edge off it, that's right. The aurora, when you've got a clear sky and an active display and you're underneath it, is staggering. I think it's one of the great sights. So next time, Ron, come with us. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? We might call it a day and go and have another cup of coffee then. Thank you ever so much for coming, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone, for coming. <laughs>